This is Mark Guerrero. Welcome to East LA Music Stories, episode 10. My guest today is Ray Jimenez, AKA Little Ray. Little Ray is a, uh, I would describe Ray as a, an authentic, real deal R&B singer, incredible performer, great vocalist, uh, one of the biggest stars in East LA in the 60s. And um, how you doing, Ray? How do you like that intro? Is that too flowery? Hey, woo. Wow, are you sure you're talking about me? I don't know the guy behind you. No. <laughs> Uh, no, well, thank I mean, you so much for the compliments. Of no, uh, it's true, thank you know. So um, let's talk about your life. Now, you grew up in uh, Delano, right? Delano. We're about 37 miles north of Bakersfield uh -huh. and uh, farm workers territory. And one of your idols was Little Richard? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When I heard Little Richard's voice, it knocked me out. Elvis, Little Richard, Fats Domino. I was right in there. Uh, I, guess that, I guess we can be called rock and roll babies because we were kind of right, right, right before the threshold of rock and roll. That's right. So is that one of the reasons you became Little Ray because the name Little Richard? Either uh, I think so. I think so because uh, I didn't name myself. Uh, it just so happened that the uh, uh, my brother, one of my brothers, I guess saw talent in me and he took me to a dance at the Filipino Hall in Delino. I was scared to death. I didn't think I could sing or anything, but anyway, he asked the band if I could go come up and I think they were a little reluctant, like, I don't know, I don't know. but somehow I think he threatened them or something. <laughs> so they let me come up there and I did, wah, bam, loom, bam, 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 you know? So, and the, and, the, and the folks, you know how it is when you see little kids, little dogs. How, how old were you at the time, would you say? Seven years old. Wow. Yeah. Now I remember that, uh, didn't they call you for a little while Little Elvis? Well, it was uh, originally Little Elvis because I was doing Elvis. I did an Elvis Presley song. And so, you know, right away, Little Elvis. And then uh, I became Little Ray using my real name. So everybody was Little something. Little Willie yeah. John. Somebody. There's a lot of little, a lot of littles back then. A lot of little people. <laughs> but, you know, back then you would spell it L-I-T-T-L-E. Right. Later on in our generation, later on, somebody said Lil, and so they spelled it like Lil, like Lily, L I L. And it was L apostrophe I L. Yeah, exactly. And now even some of the rappers are use the Lil kind of Lil thing. Wayne. Exactly. But Lil Willie G, I don't think he was ever Lil Willie G. He was Little, right? Wasn't he always Little? I I think so. Yeah, he stuck to the Little. I think so. Yeah. Um. So uh, so when you were little like that, you would just sing locally. And wasn't there something, uh, the band called the Rhythm Kings and all that? What's all that story? Oh, yeah. Well, that was the band that was playing the day or the evening that I sang. And so they saw the reaction. So the promoter asked my brother if he could bring me back to another dance, which the Rhythm Kings were playing. And eventually the, the leader, Albert Garcia, kind of saw the idea like, hey, this kid is like, you know, I wasn't really good, but I was cute back then. <laughs> you know, like I said, uh, little doggies and little kids and stuff. So the people were like, you got to go see the kids sing, you know. And so uh, they put me in the band, the Rhythm Kings, featuring Little Ray. All right. So I started going to all the gigs. I don't know how my mother allowed me to do that. Actually, there were some very good guys in the band that my parents knew uh, who were good people. And they were, they were taking care of me. Was, I was pretty young. Yeah. So you did it for quite a few years. And then uh, how did you wind up with making that record when you were like 11 years old? Uh, there's something on your mind? Well, the Rhythm Kings got very popular. I should say we got very popular, if you don't mind me saying. Um, and we were playing all over the Central California, all over Central California. Uh, very popular in Sacramento. One day we were performing at the, in the Civic, at the Civic Auditorium in Sacramento, which is a big, giant place big big place and on another um stage were a group called the four preps the four preps were very very big at the time they had santa carolina is waiting for me da -da -da -da. and it was a giant hit the bass player or singer ed cobb happened to be going through the back and checked me out we checked out the band and i guess he thought i was good long story short he got in contact with me and wanted to, to produce me on a song. 
and he wrote a song called uh, He Can't Hurt Me. And uh, he picked me up, Delano, and his, I don't know what he had, a, a really one of those fancy cars. It was weird because the whole neighborhood was like, what's going on, you know, <laughs> when he came to pick me up. He he wanted to to, to record me. He thought I had something going. And uh, I, I was doing, there is something on your mind at the time, but did right. you, Neely. So he decided to do that. And also one of the songs he wrote, he took me to, uh, uh, um, um, it was a recording studio with Armin Steiner, who was a really, really great engineer. Kind of what city? Armin Steiner. No, I said what city? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's, it was Hollywood. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. It was it was Hollywood. You could have Hollywood in a fancy car. Yeah, yeah. Well, Ed Cobb was from here. He was he was a Hollywood cat, you know. Um. Anyway, so we recorded the song. A guy named Lincoln Myogra played the piano and did the arrangements. I think he's still living. Lincoln is. And that song, There's Something on Your Mind, had been recorded by Big J McNeely? Yeah. A few people. Bobby Marchain from New Orleans. He had a, a, another hit with it. And uh, I did it back then when I was... Actually, by the time I recorded that song, I was more like 11 years old. Right. And I've heard the song, and it, you're sounding good. Now you're a little, little 11-year-old voice. But you were singing it well. And I remember there's a trombone on the record. Uh, actually, it was the back side of that. Uh, the back side with a, with a trombone. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's very apparent on that record. It Go was ahead. popular back then. Uh, there was a song by Maxine. Uh, I forgot her name, but it had a trombone. And I think he oh, okay. wanted to do it like an oldie. I remember that. No, but your vocal is good. I know you've kind of disparaged it later, just because you were a little kid. But it's not a bad vocal, especially for an eleven. It was sort of in key. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, you know, I was putting feeling on it. I was able to put feeling behind it. And I didn't know what I was doing. I just, you know, just go one, two, three. I had a pretty good timing, I guess. So, yeah. but, you know, when looking back, you go, Ooh, I didn't even know what I was doing kind of thing. But uh, yeah. little by little, you learn. And uh, so a couple of years later, uh, you went to, uh, you used to spend summers in L.A. with, who was it, a relative of yours? Yeah, my Eldest brother Robert, who had moved to Los Angeles, and he was—he uh, used to actually bring me during the summertime, while I was uh, in Delano, even before I moved back here. And he would take me to places like the uh, El Monte Legion Stadium. I did a lot of shows with Johnny Otis. Uh, Art LeBeau was was still back there. He was very. Didn't young. he? Uh, didn't he take you to South Central too? To some of those really incredible clubs in South Central. Um, I didn't do so much of that. Uh, no. I did bars and I did. Uh, no, I just like, remember hearing. I remember hearing stories that you would go hear some of these great R and B players, R and B singers that were working out in South Central. You know, that's not true. Well, that was I knew uh, Billy Preston really well. The, the mm -hmm. Billy Preston, the keyboard player, the one who played with the Beatles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. So I think it was later on where mm -hmm. I started kind of hanging out. And okay. we, we would go there and check out some fantastic people, you know. Um, I did shows with Jackie Wilson and Brooke Benton at the Paramount when I was just about 12 years old. 13. Paramount Ballroom? Yeah. Not the one here. I think there was one downtown. Uh, okay. And then at, it was at El Monte Legion Stadium that you uh, uh, worked with uh, uh, Johnny Otis? Was it Johnny there? Otis. Uh, with all the Penguins, even where I think were just brand new. A lot of those people that you, um, Tony Allen, uh, Three Tons of Joy, Mel Williams was another very popular singer, part of the Johnny Otis. Uh, he was so influential, you know, Johnny Otis. Just oh, yeah. Crazy. And, oh, yeah. Uh, but he had, he was nice enough to allow me to come up and, and, uh, and sing. Like I said, I never thought I was really that great. Uh, once again, I was young. And I think also we had a lot of Latinos in the audience. So that also probably had uh, something to do with it, you know. So his band was backing you up? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, Johnny Otis had a very popular television show uh, in the 60s. Yeah. Exactly. I would do this in the summertime, and then I would go back to school. Yeah. Finally, when I uh, decided to, to make a big run to Los Angeles, and uh, I stayed with my brother Robert uh, when I was a sophomore. I finished one year in Delano High School. I was still with the Rhythm Kings, then I decided to, you know. Is that when you went to uh, Garfield High School? Yep. 
Because I, I had you for Jim. I remember one 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 year I had you for Jim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, the, I remember we in Delano. We didn't have stuff like nutrition. I don't oh. know what the heck that what that was, you know. What's nutrition? You know, so nobody got me hip to that. So I, I was completely on my own, and I remember the, the bell rang and everybody started going towards like. So, well, I, I figured, man, it's an early lunch, you know. So I got all kind of good stuff. Oh yeah. At school, unbeknownst to me, that we had lunch just a few more hours. You know, That's hours right. Later. I forgot about that. We used to have nutrition, which was about yeah. 10 o'clock. You'd get like a 15 minute break. And there's a lot of good goodies, man. So I figured, oh, this is cool, man. Early but it wasn't months. really, it wasn't really nutritious food, but it was I called know, nutrition. No. A lot of sugar, <laughs> a Chip. lot of sugar, a lot of up stuff, you know, uh, I didn't serve coffee or nothing like that, but it was, yeah. uh, so anyway, so, so I, how I did you get in here to, to the uh, LA scene, so to speak. Yeah. So how did you uh, hook up with uh, the Midnighters? It was weird. I was somewhere during a, a lunch period, and right away, I must have just been in Los Angeles about a week, two weeks, when a guy asked me, hey, are you a singer? You know, we're just having a break, uh, lunch break or something in school. And I go, yeah, but how do you know that? I'm like, I didn't know anybody, you know? And he goes, well, I saw you. I saw you somewhere. I said, well, and then I told him, I'm, I'm from out of town, like in Delano. Oh, that's where I saw you. I have relatives out there. Mm. He said, you're really good. Da, 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 you know? And I know a band that needs a singer. And I'm going, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You know, like, I had just been there a couple of weeks. So he says, uh, yeah, it's the, they work with the Stalkers uh, Car Club. And I go, I don't even own a car. At the time, I didn't own a car. And he said, well, you know, nobody don't, owns a car. <laughs> I go, well, can, can you make a rehearsal? And I go, I don't know. I was kind of just like, not sure of things. And so finally he said, I'll pick you up. We went to a rehearsal and it was called Benny and the Midnighters. There was three Savile cousins, Benny, Richard, and Raul. Raul, Raul, Raul guitar player. And uh, who was the drummer? I think Danny Lamont was the drummer already there. Um, the we had another guitar player, Bobby Cochran. I remember him. Who was the nephew Cochran. of Eddie Cochran? Yeah. There you go. Really, he was already really good. And then Larry Randon, the the original original. You know. Now, what player. about what about Joe Farfan? He was a sax player for a while in the early. He was days. in and out. He was in and out, but it's mainly uh, uh, Larry was the main cat. And yeah. I remember I did the audition. And then they wanted to introduce me to Little Willie. Willie was already there singing, right? No, I didn't. I hadn't met him yet. No, but he was in the band already. Yeah, it wasn't really like cohesive. It wasn't like a real band. He was still like, that's that's the, that's what I'm saying. They were looking for a singer, apparently. So I think things were still being worked out, and they anticipated a gig that was coming up. So how can I say? So anyway, I did the audition. They liked me. And they wanted me to meet me, meet uh, little Willie. So I remember getting in the car, drove all the way to 43rd in Alameda, somewhere like that. And to me, it was like that kind of a thing. It was you, you know? And uh, Willie came in. He was really kind of quiet. We kind of just didn't talk really much, but got a chance to finally, after a while, we became really, really tight, you know? And the group started sounding good between he and I. You know, I think we we helped make the band good. And we started doing stuff. Uh, I remember one of the big old uh, clashes with the Blue Satins, one mm -hmm. of the Battle of the Bands things, you know. And there was a rumor that I was being hired just to, just for that night, just to, you know. But I became a regular member. Yeah, I saw you sing with Willie with the Midnighters, 1964, St. Alphonsus Auditorium. And I remember uh, Bobby Cochran. He was a blonde kid. He was the only, I think, Anglo in the group, and he had that Gretsch guitar. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I've gotten to know Bobby, and uh, you know, seen yeah, him we've recently. We've spoken a few times, a couple of years ago. Yeah, very, very yeah. cool guy. He's very um, good. But yeah, you and Willie, and I just remember uh, it was quite uh, a thing. Those uh, very dramatic, you know. First, you hear Green Onions, doom, 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 doom. curtains open slowly, 
girls start screaming. Uh, you guys are wearing uh, masks with sparkles on them, like like uh, Lone Ranger masks. Right. right. And then uh, toss them out into the audience. And it was very dramatic. And uh, it was great to see you guys and uh, two great lead singers in one band. It was, uh, I'm really glad that I got to witness that myself. You know, I was about I think, 14 at the time. I think uh, we were getting there. You know, we started <laughs> to get pretty tight. There was the Righteous Brothers that later kind of came around. So we, we kind of... Uh, we weren't competing with them, but we kind of felt a little bit at times we could we could do pretty good. Oh, we started doing their stuff too because they were duets, and he and I would do duets uh, on top of him doing some songs and me doing individual songs. The early stuff like My Babe and all that stuff. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we 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 did all of them. Even Coco Joe. Yeah, that was great. Little Latin yeah. Loopy Lou. We used to do that. One. We didn't get a chance to do that. It was a little bit later when they did it. But the earlier, early stuff, the first record they that had. That first album, I still have that one. Yeah, me too. Coco Joe. There's a monkey in the jungle named Coco Joe. Right, right, right. Yeah. Harmony all the way through. And there was a... I need, I need your love. Mm. Something like that. It was, a, it was like a duet, a slow one. Now it's coming back to me. Oh, yeah. oh and that, the, co the album cover, they had this... Uh, they almost looked like priests. They had those... Colorless Nehru. jackets. Almost yeah. like Nehru looking. For yeah, them. yeah. Um, the Righteous Brothers. Yeah. Uh, cool, was, yeah, were, were, cats could sing. Yeah, yeah. So she were in the Midnighters for a while. And I, I think uh, you guys were together, you and Willie in the Midnighters for what, about six months, maybe? It was a limited time, right? I think longer than that. I think uh, like you know, a year? You're, you're taking me way back. and oh, Maybe uh, a year? Probably, yeah. Maybe, I, I would say even longer. Wow. Uh, the, because then we started, because I still did a couple of, I think I, I, I was going to do one of the rock and roll shows. That's where one of the ones that I didn't show up on. I got stuck in the grapevine. Uh, but we started getting pretty popular, you know, and oh, yeah. uh, I, was, I was part of the group. And uh, before we get to the grapevine, because that's a big story we got to talk about. But uh, during that period, you made the record uh, Loretta with my guy on the flip side, which was my girl. Uh, Nothing you can do can take uh, me away from my girl. Yours was my girl. Yeah. A, we were working a, with a cat named uh, Tony Hilder. I was. Mm -hmm. And he had he had seen me record with the Rhythm Kings. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, he wanted me to sing that song. He thought it was going to be a hit. He heard it and he said, it's going to be a big hit because Mary Wells had to right. that. Had so my I put guy. it sort of in the backside, and I and I I put Loretta. I think it was a oh no girlfriend of mine. I wrote the song when I was just about eleven years old, thirteen, fourteen. Um, so we did it in a really four track little studio, and we I kind of arranged it right there with the Midnighters. You know, we yeah. had by that time I think we already had uh, Salazar, George Salazar, George Salazar. I think was drumming at that time. I had met him at Garfield. And I brought him in the band because I think at the time, either Danny or somebody else wasn't happening. It was a, a breakup or something. And then Romeo, at that time, Romeo was already the one playing the trumpet, not the trombone, but the trumpet, mm -hmm. Loretta. And uh, I forgot who was playing guitar. George Dominguez wasn't there yet? It might have been him by, the, by, the, by that transitional thing right there. I'm not really sure. So I still have that 45, and it's on the Impact label, a red label. Yeah, yeah. I played piano on it. Um, so. And Willie think, G was singing background, going, oh, Loretta, Loretta, oh, Loretta, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Actually, our blend was always really cool. Our, it's a good record. Our, our I like voices, it. Voices, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's. It could have had some production. I wish, you know, you, you, it would have been well, cool to spend some more time doing that. But. Yeah, but let's just say for the time, and you guys were pretty young still yourselves, it was it sounded very professional, you know. Yeah. Um, dun, dun, da, 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 on, on my girl, it had all the horn parts and everything. Very yeah, cool. you, you'll hear a few mistakes if you listen well. <laughs> yeah. And then I kind of harmonized with, uh, with my voice on that particular song. Right. So after that, uh, you kind of went solo. And is that when you wound up with uh, Bob Keane and the I Who Have Nothing? Is that around that time, 65? Man, I got to 
remember. It's hard to get the timeline. So this, our timeline isn't going to be perfect. We might jump a little bit, but let's talk about it anyway. I think it was around 65 that I Who Have Nothing came out. And uh, the flip side was I've Been Trying, which I love. Um, and it was I on the Donna Jenny label. Cardenas with at that time was involved in that. Um, we, Who did you say? Billy Cardenas. He, he must have hooked you up with Bob Keane because it came out on Bob Keane's label. Yes. Yes. In fact, he already also knew Arthur Lee. Who with, later got famous with the group Love. Love. And he wrote the song, The Backside of It. I've, I've been, been trying. trying. That's a great um, record. Yeah, it's a cool one. He did a little, this production was cool. I, I wish I had hooked up with him later on. Never thought about that. Because he had, he had, he had the, the range of ideas to really work with. And, but your and vocal song, is great. You like your vocal on that? It's pretty damn good. Well, you know what? That's another thing too. When you're, when you're, you know, certain songs are restricted or certain songs you don't feel like, mm, that song I felt like it was cool for me. I was able to hit certain notes and my range was there. Other notes, your other songs, you kind of get limited or, and then you're trying to do it at the time you're young, more commercial, simple. You're not really using your chops. Yeah. Try to keep it as simple. Uh, dead of the day. And it's always a time thing. Hurry up, hurry up, let's do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So you wish you could do it again. But um, it was a, it was a soulful song. Yeah, yeah. But, but I, who know, have I, who have, I Who Have Nothing was uh, was suggested by uh, a friend of mine. It was a Benny King version of it before. It was really great. Uh, Lieber and Stoller. Actually, Stoller wasn't involved in that. Long story short. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I've always loved that song, too. And we just did it at more, you know, really different. We played at a gig uh, for Wilson High School. When it was over around 10 o'clock at night, they took us to the Melrose Studios out there. Um, what was that called? Stereo Masters. There you go. There you go. Yeah, we and recorded. we recorded. Our bass player got drunk. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we didn't have a bass player. So we called another Mike Aversa, right? Mike Aversa, Mickey. Yes, yes. We called this cat, and it was late, and he uh, he was really really nice. He came over and he played well. He was actually a guitar player, but he brought his bass. He played with a pick. I remember that, and he did it. Mike Aversa was there with the, the original. Right. So anyway, his that band, was recorded. His band was Mickey and the Invaders. There you go. They're they from Montebello. I remember that. Yeah. Um. So anyway, that song came out. And then we 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 recorded. Uh, I've been trying somewhere else. It wasn't the same night. Was Arthur Lee there at the studio? Yes, he was pr producing me. But it was at a different studio. I can't remember where. Somewhere around the Wilshire area. Mm -hmm. Not a big studio. It was. I've never recorded there before. And uh, pretty much the track. It, it, we, we we used some of the guys from the band, and uh, I sang it there. And uh, from there, I think Billy Cardenas took it to. Um, Delphi. Yeah, and wasn't it released on Donna, one of the subsidiaries? It was Donna. Mustang was Records. It Mustang, I, I think, was one of it. Donna, I think. Yeah, it Donna. I have, I have one on Donna. Yeah, and he wound up in Atco, which was uh, they picked yes. it up with Atlantic Records. Yes. Well, Records. well, I say for me, I you know I think both sides, A and B sides, are great. I mean, your vocals are great, the recordings are great. I think it, it was an awesome record. And then a few years Thank later, you. Tom Jones recorded it. Remember, I Who Have Nothing. Well, and, and so frankly, classy. yeah, I know, but I'm just saying Tom Jones had a huge hit. And I, I still like yours better than Tom Jones. I'm sorry. Oh, wow. No, no, honestly, I do. Yeah, thank still. you. Oh, I Who Have Nothing. Yeah, he's a little over the top. But, uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, there was a version by Shirley Bassey that was really good, too. She, of course, sang it. I never heard that one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool, man. Well, that was a great record. Um, let's see. So then, uh, what about Eddie Davis? Uh, I know you did a single, at least one single, with Eddie Davis's Pharaoh Records, uh, Karen, and uh, Come On and Swim. Karen was recorded the same time as Loretta. Really? How we got the tracks, I don't know, but there was some kind of somebody, who, you know. Because I played piano on that. That's me playing piano and singing. Uh, that's why I just remembered that right now. So it was recorded the same session as as uh, my my girl or my yeah and uh, Loretta, and I sang Karen. I didn't know that. And I I I think maybe through 
through Tony Hilder or whatever, he got the tracks for that, and it was released. Um, and what about the what yeah. about the Come On and Swim that was recorded later? You know, a lot of people say, "What was that song about?" You know, swim. What? Well, the dance. There, there was a dance craze called the Swing. Yeah, and uh, there was a group. I can't remember the name right now that had an instrumental track that Eddie Davis had. They had to do something with it. So if you listen to that song, Come On and Swim, swim excuse me, um, the track was already done with that. Oh, I didn't know that either. Yeah, it was. It kind of swung. It was cool with a little uh, clavinet. It had like a Stevie Wonder thing. Stevie was really big with fingertips. So it had that kind of groove on it. So you wrote a song. You wrote a song to that existing well, track. Well, Eddie said, you know, he wanted to hook me up. So me and Max, he got Max Ubias. Ubias to write the song with me, and we wrote the song. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I wasn't crazy about the song, to be honest with you. You know, uh, I didn't like my performance. It's, it's usually the case. <laughs> um, and uh, that was it. <laughs> I remember you've told me that you don't like the vocal on Karen either. It sounds like a pretty damn good vocal, but you don't like it. <laughs> um, that was pretty good for, for, for my age. You know, I guess I was pretty cool on it. Uh, it's just that you never have a chance to do it again. Like, no, uh, I know. no, only in my own studio. I can at least say, let me do that again. Of course, you overdo it. But yeah. uh, back then is one, two, three. That's good enough. Yeah, a lot you know, of time and pressure. We, and then you listen to it later. Go, oh, man, I could have. That was a little flat. That was a little sharp, you know. Right, of course. I, to this day, I go through that. I go through and that. Uh, me being a ultra perfectionist, it doesn't help, you know. So, But, relate. yeah, looking back at it, it was kind of cool. It was kind of a cool song. It was another another girlfriend of mine. I wrote a lot of songs for girls. Uh, Loretta, Loretta, Karen. And Karen. And da, da, da. Okay, so uh, let's get to the uh, East L.A. Uh, Salesian Rock and Roll shows. You did a few of those. I saw you on a couple of those. Uh, tell me your memories about those rock and roll shows. It's tough to remember all that stuff, man. Um, I can jog your memory. <laughs> um, I remember. Well, how about the, uh, your live version of Ooh Baby Baby, where the girls are screaming? It's like the Beatles are up there, you know, like on the, it's one, on one of the albums. Yeah. The Salesian. You're doing well, Ooh Baby Baby. You know, we were the local Beatles, uh, us, including yourself. We were the, the people could relate to us because we were there and the Beatles were somewhere else. Yeah. And uh, and the hormones and all that being young, oh, yeah. I'm sure it has to do with it. And we <laughs> we used to be kind of cute back then, you know. We used to be. I yeah. had a little bit of hair, and and uh, so <laughs> so all that I'm sure helped. Um, and maybe a little talent. So Ray, tell me the story of the uh, Land of a Thousand Dances caper at uh, East LA College Auditorium, the Rock and Roll Show. Well, my recollection is. Uh, we, uh, Willie and I, uh, the Midnighters were doing a gig with Frankie Cannibal and a band. I can't remember the name of the band he was working with at the time. And he did, we, we heard him do Land of a Thousand Dances, his version with a Nana in it, which I thought was really cool. And so we started doing that. We started, you know, ourselves starting to play it. Uh, I remember telling also. Eddie Davis, who was a producer and record owner, that he should record him, record Frankie. Now, and he mentioned like, oh, you know, there's a better version by a group called the Atlantics. And I'm sure there probably was. I wasn't familiar with the Atlantics. I know Billy Cardenas had a group called the Atlantics, but there might have been some other Atlantics as well. Yeah, so that was kind of, that kind of, uh, I said, okay, cool. So one of my visits going back home, we had this rock and roll show that was scheduled at East LA College with the Midnighters. And uh, coming back that particular day, I think it was a Sunday. I think what it is, what it is I was booked at a gig on Saturday up there in, in Delano or the Bakersfield area. But there was some kind of storm or something that there was snow. We I couldn't get back from the uh the grapevine and in time for the performance at east l.a college mm -hmm. so i missed i missed out on on uh singing land of a thousand dances 
we, we had our own version. I'm not sure how we switched the vocals, whether I was singing the lead or Willie was singing the lead at the time and uh, on it. Uh, but I remember uh, that I missed out on that one. You know? and, and they wound up, because it was being recorded live, somebody put it out through KRLA. I think they were pretty connected uh, with Casey Kasem. Uh, mm. He dug the Midnighters. Casey Kasem was a, a DJ. He was very popular with a radio station named KRLA. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, their version started getting played because we were hot. And people were ready for us for something. And I think once that happened, Eddie Davis responded like, oh, my God, we got to record that song. And that's where I think Cannibal and the Headhunters started doing their version of it. And both versions were going up the charts at the same time. Well, yes. But all of a sudden, of course, Frankie's or Cannibal's version just took off more yeah. national. Yeah. They had, they had a bigger push through Eddie Davis. Eddie was really familiar with the distributors already and pushing it. Uh, whereas I think the Midnighters uh, were connected with Chattahoochee Records, right. a local a local label. And I don't think they had the distribution to really make it happen. Right. Or it just yeah. had the response beyond the LA region, which was nobody knew about the Midnighters, just in, in, in Los Angeles, so to speak, at the time. You know? yeah. Well, the Headhunters wound up like top 20 nationally and wound up touring with the Beatles, for God's sake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a great song. When you listen to it, it's just it's so unique. Yeah. You know, the performance were great. It was so sounded so live, you know. And a couple of years later, Wilson Pickett did a version of it with the Nana Nas in it. Everybody in the world started recording it. Yeah. With the Nana. Yeah, with the Nana. And yeah. it's funny, and I really feel bad about this. Uh Frankie never got the recognition and money. He never got writers on it. Yeah, because yeah. That was the whole hook. Yeah. Originally the original version by Chris Kenner. Yeah, I remember that. No Nanas had a different groove to it. Had more New Orleans. I still have that record. I had I had that record before any of uh, the East LA groups recorded Land of a Thousand Deaths. Because that record was a little bit popular in East LA. I bought the record. But mm -hmm. It wasn't a huge hit. But uh, yeah, I still have that record. Yeah, it was funky. I dug it. But what I'm saying, it didn't have that. Yeah. That dum, 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 the oh, yeah. Latin bass which, part. Which they, got, which they got from fingertips. Dum, yeah. Dum, 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 yeah. Dum, dum. yeah. Yeah, and, and just the idea of the, the, it being live, you know. And the Nana. What yeah. a great, well, the Nana is the catch. Yeah. Just the hook. You yeah. can't beat that hook. Yeah. The Headhunters had that fingertips groove. Uh, the Midnighters was a little bit different uh, mm -hmm. groove, yeah. but similar. Yeah. So after the Midnighters, and your next big band was the Progressions. And you guys played around and were very popular. And you had Clarence Ply in the group for a while. And uh, but then you went whole hog and you you created the little ray review which had the rayettes the four cliffs and the epics it was a whole oh, freaking review you have a good memory <laughs> i do i was there <laughs> so yeah that was quite a thing to do at, at that time to have that many people in your show no you did a rock and roll show with with that whole review too didn't you uh, the not the rock stuff. and roll show. We did start doing things at the big union and yes. places like that. We're just getting there. But it was, I was forming my own record company called Gemla. I right. already wanted to be a Barry Gordy and, and the Latino thing. That was really what it was made for. I had, uh, of course, I was a fan of Motown by that time and knew the story of Barry Gordy and how the temptation. Yeah. So I said, why can't we do it? It was basically that. It was so, yeah. I wouldn't say innocent, it was almost like, not even arrogant, but just sort of like I could do it. Yeah, we can do it. Why? How do you see like the difference? In other words, even though I, of course, you love the quality of those cats, but oh, well, uh, so I said, you know there. what? Instead of trying to get, I got people that never sang. Most of those kids never sang in their lives, but wow. I always chose a good lead singer. That's the key. And then I started grooming them. I spent a lot of time, you know, with like oohs, ahs, go back, and yeah. and and we uh. And even with the Ray, uh, the Rayettes. Um, and then the four clips came a little bit later. So, and it started happening. The thing is, and we're going to start recording. Our own, I already was doing original music with a guy named Eddie Lane, who was a lyricist. Mm -hmm. We had formed Jimla Records. And then Frankie Cannibal being that they were pretty hot, they were kind of cooling off by this time off, off that particular song. 
they signed with a guy named Seymour Stein, who later became, you know, with Madonna and Pretenders, Talking Heads, da 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 da. But he was recruiting a, a roster of artists for himself. He had just got a, a distribution thing with Columbia Records, with a subsidiary. I can't remember the subsidiary name. So he was looking for talent. Frankie Cannibal mentioned my name to Seymour. Seymour was in LA to check out some stuff. He saw me perform and he wanted to sign me up, which I did. I signed up with him on it. And uh, I left, I left uh, the idea of Latino Motown here, which I really regret. You know, I, I should have stayed here. You know, I had this thing going, this rolling, but you know, this is a kid, you still don't have a lot of guidance. You're kind of thinking on your own, it's the yellow brick road. You know, New York, anything like, oh, New York, you know. And, and so you abandoned, you abandoned that thing, went to New York. Yeah, I hate, and I hate, I hate the word abandoned, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> because I love the kids and I spend a lot of time. Kids, oh, yeah, but, when I say kids, they're about my age, actually. Yeah, right, right. But I always felt the, uh, you well, know. The, okay, let, let's put it that you get, you know, that Motown dream was let go to go to New York. There you go. Thank you. And um, yeah, that's a better term. And um, Cannibal the Hitters went about the same time, right? Yes, we worked together because he was signed also with Sire Productions. Seymour Stein. Sire was uh, Richard Goddard, mm -hmm. who, who also uh, who, who produced some stuff for, for people later on, became really popular um, uh, songwriter and producer. So he had hooked up with Seymour Stein. They had signed uh, Frankie Cannibal, the Headhunters. So I started working with him. I was actually signed as an artist. But I love songwriting, and I wanted to be put, I wanted to be a Smokey Robinson. I wanted to produce, which I think I had a little talent for. Uh, it was pretty organized in that manner. So I kind of put my career. I mean, actually, they took me to to promote me, but I got into it. So I started being their kind of their arranger and working working out arrangements with Frankie, and I did a few gigs with them also. Um, they, and we wrote, I wrote some stuff that was produced. I wish. I could hear some of that stuff. It was really, really good. It was under Columbia Records. So when you first got there, uh, the Headhunters were still, uh, you said the Jaramillo Brothers, you think? Yes, they, for sure. And I then know, about the sure. year later, uh, they left and uh, George Ochoa and Eddie Serrano went there. Were you still there when they were there? In the, Well, I was there for all that time, yeah. In fact, I was part of uh, the recruiting, those guys. Even the second generation, third generation, which became with... Uh, there was another people that we brought in. Uh, I forget his name now. I'm sorry. I, I don't need to forget. Um, after George left or somebody left, we had to replace him. And I became part of just trying to help Frankie. We even brought Ursi, mm. who was part of El Chicano. Right. We were going to create a, a super group on it. I forgot the name of that also. You're just kind of making me think here. It's been a long, long time. <laughs> so I worked with them for a while. Then at the time, I had my first child, and uh, I needed to get back home. But before you get back home, uh, Seymour Stein was also working with a group, which later became Aerosmith, right? Oh, yeah. And yeah. I think they were called Chain Reaction at the yes, time? Yes, you got it. Did you work uh, with them? No, I didn't work with them, but I saw them in the office quite frequently. They came in from Boston, mm -hmm. and they would yeah. come in and... And uh, they would hang out in, in, in the, uh, the studio. They had like a studio in there and, and offices. And then we went out to eat together and stuff. So it wasn't a real buddy-buddy, uh, but yeah. that was part of what was going on. Yeah. Later to find out, they became Aerosmith. Right, right. So then you went home. But before we get to that segment, we I want to get back to a couple of things we skipped. And uh, one of them is um, for a while there, you were playing uh, backed up by the premieres of Farmer John fame. And one of the gigs you did was at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. What year would you guess would that, would that have been? I had just let, exit the Midnighters and I didn't have my group then. I, if, if my recollection is when my memory serves me well here. Uh, and Eddie Davis and Billy had the premieres. Yeah. And this is before Farmer John. So he want, they started doing some gigs at the Fullerton Ballroom, I think, something. Uh, the Rhythm Room. The Rhythm Room. 
I did some gigs. I did a gig on here on, not the Paramount, but uh, what's the one out there on, used to be Cesar Chavez upstairs. A CYO. 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 I did some gigs with the, uh, with the premieres. So I became sort of their singer. I think they were trying to hook us up. Uh, I got a call from Tony Hilder, who was responsible for Loretta. And he also had seen me years ago with the Rhythm Kings. He was a producer and writer. Um, he wanted to book me, and he did book me and the premieres at a sur surf fair. Surf, like uh, ocean. And I'm looking like, we're not really a surf band. But he wanted us to record some original material, a thing called Shake, Shout, and Soul. And um, I forget the other one. Soul, Soul and Stomp. Soul and Stomp. I actually wrote both of the songs with with uh, Tony Hilder. He had given me some lyrics and uh, I created the stuff and we put some quick arrangements with uh, with the premieres. So here we were dressed in tuxedos. We're, we're young, you know? We, everything was tuxedo. You want to dress the best you can when we do a gig. So we go to the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium, big ballroom, nothing but surfers, you know, T-shirts and shorts and blonde and you know, all of that stuff. So we, <laughs> I... so did we feel out of place? Yeah. You know, um, I was brought up in Delano where you're in the West Side with you know, Chicanos, Filipinos, and and blacks. Those, those with my buddies, you know. People of color. Yes, as, as they say nowadays. Yes. But in order to go to the schools, we had to go across the tracks to the better part, which was more Anglo. Which I got along with everybody anyway. But that's the way it was back then. It was pretty segregated, you know. And uh, especially the farmers being so rich. And we were like farm workers. My families were farm workers, you know. Um, so it, just to say that I got along with everybody. But when I saw these surfers, it was really like, whoa, we're out of here. We're out of place here, you know. So we started doing the songs. And at first it took a little while. But before you know it, we had the people. We had them. And took a little while. Yeah, yeah. At it, first, it, were they a little bit uh, unwelcoming? Yeah, and this sort of were because we we were we didn't fit in, in, in it, you know. Who are these once, guys? The ones we started playing, they warmed up to it, warmed up to the beat, and if you, I think there's some copies of the uh, there's an album with Shake Shot and Soul in it, and when, when I've heard it recently, and it's it's very dynamic. Was it recorded there at that performance? Yeah, it was live. Oh, wow. Recorded wow. live. Mistakes all right. and all. I remember being really hoarse because we had did a gig the night before, but somehow it still sounded pretty soulful, you know. And you could hear the response of the people getting into it. I can picture them now starting to warm up with us, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was a, uh, and uh, we tuxedos and all, we're we're pretty good. And it, yeah. looking back in time, you saw how tight the sound was for the premieres, how tight the drum. Oh, they're very funky, man. The guitar. Yeah. That sound, that East LA thing that later became very popular with some of the guitar players, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the bass line. There was something pretty funky about that, man. Was, Absolutely. And they went on to back up Cannibal of the Head Hunters on a couple of their tours mm -hmm. after their hit. Right. And they were turned together, yeah. And then they had their own hit, Farmer John. Yep. Yep. I just uh, interviewed uh, Lawrence Perez on one of my podcasts, I mean, one of my Zoom shows. A few weeks ago. Oh, the sweetest of people. Yeah, great Their guy. parents were so nice, always welcoming, uh, you know, they're great people. Yeah. So let me do this before we get to you coming back to New York. It's the thing that I do when I interview somebody that I was on the bill with a lot in the 60s, I uh, I look at the flyers, you know, and to talk about it just to see if it triggers memories and so we can mention some of the other bands. But, okay, the first flyer that I have that we – you and I were on the same bill, was um, at the Bel Air Roller Drome. And we were discussing it a while ago. We're not sure if it was Pico Rivera or Whittier, but it was on Whittier Boulevard, but way away from East LA. And it was a roller drome. And on the bill, Robert and Johnny, who famously had, uh, you're mine and we belong together. Right. Lil Ray, Lil Ray, Shake Sound Soul and Loretta are mentioned. Really? 
Yeah. Yeah, that's two different records. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Great Blendells, La 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 La, Huggies Bunnies, uh -huh. and the World's Littlest Big Band, Mark and the Escorts. Hey. That's what they used to call us at first because we were younger. <laughs> so that was uh, uh, August 7th, 1964. Oh, my okay. God. Now, here's one at the um, Big Union Hall on 49th. It says dance, 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 uh, presenting the ever popular sisters, the sisters with sure. Hersey. Sure. And it says, and their brother Art. I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah, he used to sing. Really? Uh -huh. I don't remember him. Back by popular demand, the Soul Brothers and four great bands Lil Ray, new recording I've Been Trying, and his new band, The Great Percussions. That's probably a mistake. <laughs> It was supposed to be the progressions. It's supposed to be the progressions, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, there were a lot of errors on the flyers. Yeah. Uh, and then the very popular Ronnie and the Casuals, remember yeah. them? They, they were, were the great. Pomona Casuals, right? Yeah, later they like... became Pomona Casuals. Yeah. But at uh -huh. first, Ronnie and the Casuals, I Want to Do the Jerk, mm -hmm. the New and Exciting, the Blue Notes, and, uh, and Mark and the Escorts, a fast rising hey, group. There you go. A fast rising group. <laughs> okay. Okay, now here's the biggie. West Coast East Side Review at the Shrine Auditorium. It's a big one. Yeah, February 21st, 19... I think it was... Could have been, yeah, 65. The Atlantics, the Blendells, the Blue Satins, Cannibal, the Headhunters, Ronnie and the Casuals, Mark and the Escorts, the Heartbreakers, the Jaguars, and the Salas Brothers. Salas Brothers later founded Tierra. Mm -hmm. Lil, Lil Ray, the Little Heartbreakers, the Medallions, the Midnighters, the Pageants, the Premiers, the Four Queens, the Romancers, the Sisters, and the Slauson Brothers, oh my which was God. George Ochoa, George Ochoa yeah. and his brother. But what a lineup, huh? That's a lot wow. of groups. It was a, it was a marathon. Must yeah, all and that. it was hosted by Dave Hull, the Hullabaloor, and yeah. Carol A. Yeah, he was a really popular DJ at the time. Yeah. Now here's one. It's uh, at the uh, Belvedere Park Auditorium, which was kind of like a almost like a gymnasium, but it's mm -hmm. a big room with a stage and uh, presents Lil Ray singing. I've been trying the sisters singing G baby G Ronnie, the Pomona casuals. Now they added Pomona. Mm -hmm. I want to do the jerk and Mark and the escorts guys wear ties. Girls dress nice. <laughs> March 5th, 1965. Do you remember that venue, the Belvedere park? Probably I remember don't. the place. And I sort of, uh, like when you said jail, they kind of, ah, yeah. Yeah, but I, I don't remember the gig, to be honest with you. Now, now, here's another legendary one. In the parking lot of Johnson's Market on Whittier Boulevard, on a flatbed truck, um, 1965, the Midnighters, the Night Themes, Ronnie the Casuals, the Queens, must be the four Queens, the Sisters, Little Ray, the Ambertones, Little Egypt, Mark and the Escorts, the Blue Angels, the Counts, and the Vandells. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That one I remember. Yeah. Oh, that's that hard to yeah. forget on the truck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Behind the Johnson's Market, which was a, there was about two or three Johnson's Markets, where I recall. Yeah. One on Whittier Boulevard, maybe two of them on Whittier, and then one uh, in Montebello also, I think. Yeah. 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 That, that was the market. And um, here's another one. This is um, trying to get June 5th, 1965. The Record Inn presents. The Record Inn was one of the three music stores on Whittier Boulevard. Yeah, exactly. Mike Carcano. Mike Carcano. Uh, Showtime. Lil Ray singing I Who Have Nothing. The Midnighters. Ronnie and Casuals doing the Freddy. The Sisters with G Baby G. The Counts. Pat and Lynn. I don't remember them. Mark and the Escorts. The Vandells and Little Egypt and the VIPs, who later became El Chicano. Right. And a benefit show for Ben Sierra. I don't know who that is. Boulevard um, Theater. Boulevard Theater. You got to remember that show. Yeah. In front of the screen. Yes. Yes. And that night, you borrowed our drums. You guys, I forgot. Maybe you just showed up. You said, hey, can we use your equipment? I don't know if you use the amps too, but there's, there's a picture. It's on my website. MarkGuerrero.com, get a commercial. <laughs> uh, there's a picture of you guys, Little Ray and the Progressions, and the drum head says Mark and the Escorts. <laughs> I love it. 
where you're looking at him borrow your shoes or something. I, I, I've done that before. Oh my God, I forgot my shoes. Who, what size do you have? You know, <laughs> so, all, all that stuff happens, man, sometimes when, exactly. you, when you're out there on the road. Okay, here's another one. This is um, Friday, 3rd of September, 1965, Montebello Ballroom. Um, the premieres, Armor John, Blue Satins, Mark and the Escorts, and the VIPs. And then, then it's on the same flyer, they announced the next week's show on the 5th of September. Uh, not the next week's, two days later. We're on the 3rd of September, you're on the 5th of September. Labor Day weekend. Sunday, the Midnighters, Land of a Thousand Dances, Whittier Boulevard, Little Ray, the Amber Tones, the Progressions. No discounts on this one. Dressy dress, $2 to get uh, in. Wow. Okay. $2. There's another Montebello $2. ballroom. Friday, 17th of September, 1965, headlining Roy Head. Treat her nice. Yep. I, 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 tell you now I remember that gig because I remember doing the gig with him. Roy the Head, thing yeah. about the Montebello Ballroom, it was a very nice place, but no elevators. It was a long the stairs, stairs, wide, but equipment. And back then, Hammond organs and yes. Amplifiers, you know, and remember there was you remember there was two stages, the one on the bottom and one on the top. Yeah. So you might have to go up another level to set up on the top stage. Oh yeah, there was a few there were a few halls like that at the uh, Roger Young Auditorium at uh, Huntington Ballroom, Huntington yeah. Park Ballroom. Yeah. That you needed uh, no elevators. There was a, a couple of years ago I went to the Montebello Ballroom and I got in and it's still the same. They still have the two stages. But the top stage, they just use for storage of chairs and stuff. But it's the same room, same stages, everything, but it's turned into a Spanish language venue. Yeah, music. it's been like the La Terraza or something like that. Yeah, yeah. The, the terrace or something, yeah. yeah. So anyway, Roy Head was headlining Montebello Ballroom. Lil Ray and the Progressions, Mark and the Escorts, there we are again. The Royal Gems, do you remember them? No, I don't. I, I vaguely remember them too. There were so many bands, you know, and we were always working. Thank God, as you can tell, you were always working too. Yeah, always. So it's hard to check out the other bands unless you were booked. Yeah, the, the same and sometimes time. we had to go and, to another gig. And even then, you didn't get a chance to see them, like you yeah. just said. We yeah. had to get out of there real quick and go somewhere else in the same night. And then on the same flyer, it talks about one, two days later, same thing. And it was marking the escorts, the exotics, and the Royal Gems. You remember the exotics? Oh, yeah. They, they were good. They, they were, were cool. You know what was different about them is they had more of a rock edge, if you want to call it rock back then. Yeah, no, they, I mean they were they loved like the Kinks and the kind of hard edged. Uh, well, British back then groups. it was more rockers than it was yeah. R and B. Yeah, they had, yeah. had that edge, you know, even yeah. Stones kind of that more, yeah. more yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. they were good. Um, okay, here's another one. This is uh, Montebello Armory. Do you remember that venue? Yeah. yeah. JFK Club, big big dance, October 9th. 1965, the Amber Tones, their latest recording, I Need Someone and If I Do, Little Ray and the Progressions, the fabulous Jades. You just mentioned the Jades. Yes. They were from, uh, where's San Pedro? San Pedro, Wilmington, San Pedro area. And you said they're Filipino? Yeah. They were, well, they had a, a, like, a couple of Latinos and the rest of them were, were Filipinos. I, I knew them pretty well. We worked together, actually. Really yeah, talented, good. really talented. Yeah, I remember we played with them once at the uh, Rainbow Gardens as well. Mm -hmm. And Mark and the Escorts, that was a lineup. Amber Tones, Little Rain, the Progressions, the Jays, and Mark and the Escorts. Donation, $2. Okay, and here's another Montebello Ballroom. You can't even uh -oh. get nothing for $2. Can you imagine going <laughs> I know. to... I know. <laughs> All those bands. You paid $30 $2. for parking at the Staples or in much less... Uh, that's you know, right, yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, 5th of November, 1965, Montebello Ballroom, Little Ray, Mark and the Escorts, Originals, Progressions, and Jades. We called this all back. Now, here's one at the All Nations Hall. Remember that place? On, on Soto? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, December 19th, 1965, Huggies Bunnies and U.S. Marine Corps presents Toys for Tots Dance, featuring Little Ray and the Progressions, Mark and the Escorts with their new record, Dance With Me. The Emeralds with Anthony Beret's band. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, very good band. And the Dreamers. I don't remember them. Sporty Dress. So now we're back to uh, Montebello Ballroom, 21st of January. This must be getting into 1966. 
and uh, Mark and the escorts, Little Ray, the progressions, and the VIPs. Once again, later became El Chicano. And what what uh, venue was that? This was Montebello Ballroom. Oh, it was Montebello. I know yeah, this was one of the rare thing. times. This yeah. is one of the rare times we're we're named we're named above Little Ray. Hey. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> How'd that happen? Okay, All right. now here's here's another one. Fourth of March, nineteen sixty six. I'm assuming. Montebello Ballroom, Little Ray, Progressions, Mark and the Escorts, The Exotics, and The Exciters. Okay, here's... Well, I um, think, uh, who was with The Exciters? Uh, uh, Mondragon. You know Willie Mondragon? Yeah. Yeah, I think this was The Exciters. It's the first time I've heard it in a while, The Exciters, you know. Willie Mc Mondragon's yeah. sons, uh, Eric oh, and yeah. Billy became really yeah. good. Down with three, DW3. Yeah. 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 Okay, so here's Big Union Hall, April 16th. Um, I think 66, I'm guessing. Um, the Midnighters and Little Willie G, Little Ray and the Progressions, the Ambertones, the Sisters, the Rayettes, the Epics. Wow. Now, at this time, I changed the name of my band from Mark and the Escorts to the Men from Sound. And we had the same drummer, bass player, and uh, me. Mm -hmm. uh, Rick Rosas, Ernie Hernandez, and me, and all new guys. We kept shifting. That was always the nucleus of all the bands. But now we're the men from Sound, based on the man from Uncle. You're the men from right, Sound. Right, right. I kind of got that. Yeah. <laughs> and cool. uh, then the, the Prophets. Remember them? They were good. Yeah. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the Impalas, Ronnie Reyes, and those guys. I never okay. got a chance to see them, but uh, they were they were getting very popular by the time. Yeah, and they did it's a lot of records. Rated for me to go to New York. I was just yeah. When you mentioned the the Rayettes and all that, we're just we just did a few gigs before I, I took off. The Impalas did a couple of records for uh, Chattahoochee because they were I think they were managed for, with Eddie Davis for a while. I mean oh, not okay. Eddie Eddie Torres. Eddie Torres. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now here's Big Union Hall, twenty first of May, sixty six, the Revingtons. Is that Papa Papa Umama? Got it. Little Ray, I have nothing. The progressions, the enchantments. Remember the enchantments? That was Eddie. Uh, Eddie uh, Brambilla? No. Eddie. Bobby Brambilla and no, Eddie no. Serrano. Eddie Serrano. The lead yeah. singer, Eddie, yeah. yeah. Um, they they were teenage fair champs in 1966. The men from sound, the emeralds, and the VIPs again. And here's one, uh, Huntington Park Ballroom. That's a whole other venue. Yeah, well, that, I mentioned that one. Uh, that's another thing with no elevators. Stairs. <laughs> Stairs. A lot of stairs, yeah. Okay, this is the Royal Counts, a dancing show. Little Ray and Review, whole review. Uh, the Ambertones, the Exotics, the Men from Sound, the Righteous Rhythms with Tina and Marty, the Go-Go Girls, May 14th, Huntington Park Ballroom. And then they asked us back right away, uh, August 20th, 66, Huntington Park Ballroom, Little Ray's Review, Epics, Rayettes, Four Clefts, Progressions, the Men from Sound, Delighters, Exotics, Righteous Rhythms. We did a lot of gigs with Righteous Rhythms. And last but not least, uh, East LA College um, Auditorium. But this was not a rock and roll show. This was a benefit for the Delano farm workers uh, starring Little Ray and his review. Also, The Enchantments, The Men from Sound, The Righteous Rhythms, The Centurions, The Epics, the gems, the royal topics, the clefts, and little Michael J. December's children. Boy, they they threw everything. Progressions and the Rayettes. They just threw all your groups oh, everywhere. I don't together. remember that one. Do you uh, remember I, that gig? Little Michael J. might have been my nephew who just passed away. Michael, who met him. Really? This was October thirtieth, sixty-six. Donation one dollar seventy-five cents. Wow. So there you have it. Wow. We played a lot of gigs together, man. <laughs> There was probably a lot more that we did that were oh that I don't have flyers for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, that's your your so, my, my brain uh is it exploding a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you came back from New York and what did you do? Well, you know, by that time I had uh, my first child, Jamie, and uh being separate uh from my family was pretty tough moving to New York and here. So I decided to do the right thing and come back home. So I started, uh, I needed to make money to support my family. 
So I had some friends from Bakersfield who mentioned there was a club out there and it would be great to start a band and work there. So we got the gig and uh, I performed there for a while and made some pretty good money, you know, able to keep things rolling and and the band became re really good. Uh, so after maybe six months, eight months of playing there, came back to, to L.A. and started right away. We got some gigs. Uh, I did more steady gigs at the time because I needed to make. Now I had a family to support. So I worked quite a bit like in nightclubs and hotels. And uh, that went on for a while. So I started uh, performing as Ray and the Idols and got really popular. Yes. In, in now, now, now did, did God's Children come first or did they Ray and the oh, Idols? Oh, that was way back. That was yeah, uh, so. So, but that was when you got back from New York. Was a, a God's yeah. Children. Now you now you now you're making my mind kind of remember that a little bit better. Yeah. When I came back, you did the Bakersfield thing and that band, and then I think it was God's Children. Yeah, it must have been around 1970. Yeah. A little right about that time, because I was in performing at the Wagon Wheel and uh, Ventura. My son was born mm -hmm. in 1970. Just, I could relate to that right now. And I remember Willie coming down and talking to me. Willie G. Decided, Willie G, little Willie G. And we decided to hook up again. And we're on our way to Las Vegas. Uh, we already were booked with the group that I was working there. And from that point on, we uh, I did a thing there, uh, Vegas for about two months, three months. And then we decided to go back to Bakersfield because it was easy to get, you know, rooms and they pay you really well because there was a lot of entertainment. We were kind of special, if you don't mind me saying. <laughs> and I was already popular there by doing the other gig before. Wow. You're, you're, my, my, my mind is starting to work here. And so we got together with the uh, three ladies, uh, Willie and I, so it became God's Children. We worked for about maybe six months. We're working on a show. And then uh, Eddie Davis flew us in to do a, 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 a theme from uh, Ben. Uh, was it Matt Lincoln? Matt Lincoln. There you go. But it was... Who was the the, the main uh, artist, the the actor? I forgot who that was. Yeah, he was really popular. Might have been something. Yeah. Oh, you mean when he, the Ben Casey, the guy who played Ben Casey? Yes, there Vince you go. Vince Edwards. Vince there Edwards. You oh, you got it. You got it. I knew there was a Ben there, <laughs> and uh, so apparently it, it got played in regional areas. You know, it was a pretty good song actually. Uh, and at that point, we decided to come back to L.A. and hit it and try to get popular as God's children. Uh, uh, and that didn't... song, uh, was that uh, Hey, Does Somebody Care or something like that? Yeah. What was it? That was it? That was a theme song from Matt. Good record. And it came out on Uni Records, which was an MCA major label. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, they had some play. They had some uh, regional play in New Orleans and certain areas. It wasn't a national hit, but it, uh, it got played. Well, in 2018, a compilation of God's Children's recordings came out on Minky Records. Um, so it was quite a few songs, right? A lot of yeah. them. Mm -hmm. And um, they sounded pretty good. Like you said, uh, some of them were kind of rough mixes. or uh... Yeah, some I think were just in a demo level. In other words, we didn't. We were going to go back and do something yeah. with it. Uh, yeah. And then some things were also re-recorded as far as the tracks. Mm -hmm. Um all in all, I just, I thought, and, and also they had some old tracks that Willie and Lydia did by themselves. Mm -hmm. That wasn't really in the wrong, mm -hmm. but it was part of that compilation, for God's Children. Because wow. uh, once we broke up, they kept the name for a while. And right. then I think Eddie Davis recorded just Willie and Lydia, one of the singers, mm -hmm. uh, as a as a duel. Yeah. They had a couple some of, of is... love or one of those songs. Some of that stuff is cool, though, because it becomes like a historic document, you know, like you know, even the Beatles, they bring out the other alternate takes of stuff and rough this. People like to see, you know, 
for a sake of hit for the sake of history it's mm -hmm. kind of cool that that document exists otherwise there'd be nothing otherwise there'd be nothing on god's children so yeah yeah kind of cool it's, i am I, um, I don't put it down <laughs> <laughs> okay let's see what we got here um oh yeah i was going to mention too that the name god's children was still it sounds like it's a christian group but it really wasn't it was a secular group but the god's children concept was kind of like a hippie thing we're all god's children right yeah i created the name myself mm -hmm. because of that we were all i had long hair willie had long hair lydia had long hair <laughs> we were a kind of clean looking hippies you know what right. I mean? our yeah. mentality our spiritual thing was there right you know and um we we're different from that era and yeah it just fit right god's children looks like we all god's children you know kind that's of right thing. it had nothing to do really with a like a religious thing yeah like right spiritual thing yeah. so what's the story of your recording uh leave her alone i wrote that song and this is the time when i was with columbia records and i was i produced uh some of the rayettes that produced cannibal and the headhunter this was around uh would you, would you guess like 67 66 67 66 67 is a good time yes yes and uh so we record a lot of the stuff back in, in new york and also here in hollywood at the uh, columbia uh, on uh studios and sunset on and was only one of the songs released or what was it one yeah, single or what? at the time as i said my i had a, a child and we decided to part ways with with sire productions um and so they still released it and I think they released it under Ray Jimenez rather than Little Ray. What label was it on? Columbia. It's pretty impressive. It was on Columbia, yeah. And uh, um, it's if you see it on YouTube, it's gets quite a bit of uh, plays on it. Of course, there's a lot of versions, very scratchy versions from people that put it there. That you know, from the from forty five. Uh -huh. I I have a nice memory. Uh, you invited me. Way back then, we're talking like 66, to come down to Columbia Studios in Hollywood. And uh, I think you had recently heard some of my original songs. And, uh, but anyway, for whatever reason, I, I was pretty honored because I was, you know, I was pretty much, I think, 15 years old, 16 at the most. And I came down to the studio with my 12 string Rickenbacker. I had a solid body 12 string Rickenbacker. And, uh, I played on something and I have almost no memory of anything except being there and Columbia Studios, but I don't remember anything. You probably don't remember anything about it either. Right? I do. I oh, do. What do you remember? Because it was one of those things where I still was in contact with, uh, with Seymour. And I mentioned that you were really talented. It's like, you know, other artists that were around the area. Mm -hmm. And I remember that you were very talented and I, I and you were a songwriter somehow i set up like either an audition or something like that was supposed to be set up where you yeah. actually yeah i, I think just remember original, being there i think it was an original song that you did I, I maybe think, uh, yeah because yeah, i i remember part of that well i just was, uh, it was very cool of you to invite me it was very cool well you know you've always been really talented man so it was like <laughs> hey <laughs> Share it. You never know what goes right. That's Maybe right. For you, it might work with someone else. Right, right. Um, we can get into the 80s now. Um, we reconnected in the 80s. Uh, somehow we were playing at some gig. I think I had it written down. It was in Stanton, which is in Orange County. Mm -hmm. It may have had something to do with I was in a band and you were in a band playing at the, uh, the starting gate in Los Alamitos. Yeah. Remember that place? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I just about lived there for a while, raising. Yeah. By that time, I had three children, you know, three yeah. kids. And, but we, it was really cool because we kind of rehooked up, and we we played at this other venue. And this time, you know, I remember borrowing a PA from you guys. You guys were playing somewhere, and I said, "Hey, can we just use your PA since we're going to be there too?" And you let us, you know. And I guess maybe it was payback for the drums that we loaned you at the Boulevard Theater. <laughs> you know, With twenty your name years. On it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, I remember you being in a duel with another guy. You guys Armstrong, were really, really good. Armstrong and Guerrero. There you go. I think it was, might have been there. Yeah. And, and the venue itself, I'm not sure. Yeah. Because uh, I did a lot of Orange County. We we started being named uh, 
Ray and the Idols. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and you came down to our gig. We were playing at, in Fountain Valley at a Jeremiah's restaurant. Yeah. And we had a band. Sometimes Alex and I were just a duo acoustically. Sometimes we'd have a drummer and a keyboard player. And we'd go electric. And we had a band. And I remember uh, you came down to see us. And I remember we did Bring It On Home To Me, the original style with uh, Lou Rawls and uh, uh, Sam Cook. Sam Cook. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, um, we, you know, because you were there, I said, we better play some fucking good <laughs> little razor we better really oh, do wow. our best but anyway we did really well i think you were impressed and then i went to see you uh ray and the idols at some venue in long beach at the time we so did so of... many gigs yeah it was yeah. amazing we're, we're working just about every day in different places yeah which made it difficult in a way because we had to break down rest uh, the next day set up it was constantly but we we're we we're working I had a family, man. I had to work as much as I could. Oh, man. <laughs> and those were the times when the place were packed, like oh, lights yeah. outside. You know what I mean? Yeah, it sounded great. Yeah. And then we ran into each other at the Steve Probst Rock and Roll Party cable TV show down in Long Beach. And I was there. It was, it was me and Alex Armstrong and Leo Valenzuela. And acoustically, I did three of my songs. I remember doing Mexican Moon. Um, was that a film? A was, we're filming a television show, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. I don't know if you were there when I performed, but I did like three of my songs with the acoustic trio. And then you came on with your band. And one of the songs you did was Take Me to the River, okay. Wash Me Down. Oh, and I still have, have that on video, by the way. You performing you that. You still have what? A video of that. Of you really? Doing that song. I'd yes. love to. Ooh, I, I think I want to see it. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. It's really I think good. I also did. Uh, my memory serves me well once again. I think it does. Uh, Sam Cooke song. Uh, I was born by the river. Uh, change is going to come. Oh man! Now that now that you're bringing it up, yeah. you had a great little funky band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was cool. It yeah, was so cool. that was another thing. A Steve Pro show. Is he still uh, alive? Is he? Uh, yeah, he's still, still around. Yeah. Ah, that's a knowledgeable guy, man. He was pretty yeah. cool. Too. Maybe I'll email him and see if he'll give me permission to put that up on YouTube. Oh, I, you won't regret it because it's really good. I mean, you wouldn't oh, mind, I think. It's great. I would love to see it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, then, uh, when did you start your uh, Sanctuary Studios? It's been, uh, well, I wanted to buy in a building 22 years ago. Um, I needed a place because I had moved to Rancho Cucamonga with my kids and I lived in Chino for a while and I was performing all over the place and raising my kids. They're already getting older already. And so I needed to move. Um, I wanted to move back. My brother owned some property. So I went up staying in, in, in one of his place for a while. I saw a guy that said he owned a place. So I liked the place which turned out to be this building here. And then I, this long story short, I, I want to buy in it, you know, and to renovating it. And at first it was like a rehearsal facility. Now it's a full fledged recording studio. And we're going to start filming here videos. And we're going to start us. Uh, actually, we're starting our own television network, Los Angeles Entertainment Network. Uh, wow. Our first show is going to be LA Performer. So anyway. So, yeah, well, well, you know, just so the audience will know, uh... I'm here at your studio as well right now. We're just in, uh, you're in the, uh, the, what would you call it? The, control the, uh, room. Control room, and I'm out here. The tracking so, uh, room. So, yeah, this this backing is just, uh, we're, we're in the same place, actually. Um, but, yeah, I mean, for those that don't know, I mean, it's quite complex because you got a great recording studio. You live ab above it, and uh, you've got a patio out there, and you got an office out there. It's a whole, it's a complex. What can you say? Yeah, it's it's a good piece of property, and uh, it's getting pretty busy. We just had Starbucks two doors down, just opened up, and they're starting to get out. Uh, the whole area is really uh, a lot of renovation going on, uh, which is which is pretty cool. It helps the the value of the land, but in the meantime, we're still in, in a pandemic. We're oh still, yeah, it's we're a still, challenge. It's not quite the same as it was when we could work anywhere at any time. Right. You know, now there's still the the limitations of that. Um, and I'm still careful. I respect the fact that, uh, you know, it's a serious thing still. Yeah. And, um, 
but uh, it's all I ever wanted to do in my life: perform. I just wanted to sing, actually. But you're one of the <laughs> you're one of the rare people, though, that is extremely talented as uh, musically and as a singer. But you're also very enterprising. I mean, not too many musicians can pull this off or do a little Ray review. I mean, you've always been very uh, enterprising. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. And uh, yeah. it, it's sort of an, you know, um, you got to do a lot of things yourself. A lot of, a lot of times you think uh, someone's going to save you, someone's going to be the one, yeah. you know, and a lot of times you're lucky, but a lot of times you're not in terms of you got to do it yourself. Save yourself. Yeah, yeah, and and if that's what you want to do. You got to create an environment where where you work best at. And this studio is just it's it's wonderful. I mean, I, I like it. Is uh, it technically in Montebello? No, it's East Los Angeles. East Los Angeles. It's yeah. We're actually uh, <clears throat> the corner of Beverly and Atlantic, one block east on on Beverly. Uh, yeah. I love this. I'm right off the 60 freeway and great uh, location. Uh, and it was this was a building that's been here since 1949. Uh, back then, people from back east were used to living this way. They would uh, buy a piece of property and build their homes on top, and their businesses would be in, in the bottom. So okay. it was a, it's, it's, if, you, if you go down Beverly, you'll see a few of these. And it was very popular design. Now, did, do you still uh, uh, have uh, people come and rehearse here, too? Do you have rehearsal facilities or no? Oh, yes. That's, that's a lot of our business, actually. We do a lot of recording. But we still have people that need a rehearsal place, and it's a great sounding room. Yeah. Well, as you know, I've rehearsed here many times. Yeah. Various shows with various bands, with Yaki, with various people. Plus, I've interviewed people here for the Great Day in East L.A. project with Piero Giunti. There you go. Uh, so, I mean, I have a history of coming here to uh, to rehearse or uh, interview. Well, great very history. soon, we're just opening up now our back area, which is pretty large, uh, patio and parking area. We're, we created something along with my my, my daughter, Stacy, called the Beverly Rose, being that we're all Beverly. Uh, it's it's going to be an event venue that we can, uh, we've already had the Super Bowl here and some parties, and uh, we're going to be leasing it out and renting it out for events. I remember I remember coming to an event in the patio out there years ago where you, you performed with your band and your daughter yeah. sang and People sat at tables. It was like a, an outdoor nightclub. It's great. Yeah, and back then it was really, really cool. But now it's like I, I got so busy that I, I really couldn't keep that up. You can't just do everything yourself. And I have, I've had some good help, but uh, it just takes so much of your time from being an artist. Right. You know, just, just you know how it is. Even surviving, you got to get to oh. the, rent, the mortgage payments, and then find time to sit down and write a song. Yeah. Or, or to to learn a new song, and then if you have to perform. It's just very time consuming. So you have to let go of certain things. Right. But now with my daughter being involved, Stacy, uh, she has the energy and she wants to promote that area. As well as now we're focusing on the, the our new network, our television network. We're going to be filming here music uh, programs, as I said earlier. And um, it's, it's going to be coming right out of here. Nice. Now, a few years ago, you put out an album, and uh, was it called Mi Oración de Paz, or was that one of the song titles? Remember that album you put out? Well, uh, I've done some stuff in Spanish. I have a, my one of my partners, Dora Winveld. She's mm -hmm. from Argentina, mm -hmm. and uh, I love her her lyrics. And so we wrote some songs together. And we Is that what that album was? Yes. We and used, you went uh, by, you used the name Ramon Jimenez for that, right? Yes, I've always been like, you know, I'm still from... Delano, mm -hmm. Ramon Perez Jimenez, you know, that's my, mm -hmm. my real name. And oh. uh, so I use that as uh, being that it was in Spanish, the majority is in Spanish. Yeah. But yeah. they're interesting, they're all original material. It's all original. In fact, they're um, Christmas songs. Yeah. We wanted to create Christmas stuff. And, mm -hmm. it's, and, and uh, a lot of them are really pretty cool. Looking back, I listened to every song and go, wow, those are good songs. You is know? that still available? Uh, I think you can get them in a CD Baby. Mm -hmm. I think they were still available a uh, while back. Mm -hmm. that, I say that because we had a couple of albums that we had with different artists. Speaking of product, uh, you know, after I interviewed you years ago for my uh, uh, internet radio show, which now is a podcast, uh, mm -hmm. Chicano Music Chronicles, I think I interviewed you like in 2007 for that. Yeah, I went to your and house we played, in Palm Springs. Yeah, my house, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we I played 
all your most of your singles, most of your records on the show. And I, I was kind of frustrated because those a lot of your stuff wasn't available anymore. So I actually got a meeting with Bob Keen, you know, uh, uh, who, you know, who released Richie Valens records and, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of East L.A. people. And I had a meeting with him. I said, hey, man, why don't you put out a compilation of all Little Ray's singles, you know? And he goes, well, he goes, I'd rather put out. He wanted to put in a compilation of everybody like Romancers, Little Ray, yeah. like that. And so nothing ever happened. He was already getting a bit old at the time. I think he passed away two, three years later. But uh, I, I wish that there was like a Little Ray compilation that never really Well, happened. you know, um, he, I only did a couple of things with his label. I, uh, it was a long story. We probably don't have time to get into it. Um, but I did try to do something before, but it, it wasn't the quality wasn't quite there. It was basically through old records mm. and the sound quality wasn't good. It was some of the original ones that I did. Um through this promoter to wanted it was only supposed to be very local for a local record shop but then he started getting more people started buying it mm -hmm. and once again that's sort of the way i am uh, uh they were very scratchy some of the well products. nowadays the technology exists you can take the scratches out and all kinds of stuff yeah yeah i think what i'd like to do and i've been thinking about is re-record some of that stuff myself i, I you know i've got a recording studio first class recording studio i might mm -hmm. i might do that if i'm going to do that at all Okay. And then you released a, a, a CD uh, as a tribute to uh, the Garfield school teacher, Jaime Escalante. Remember that? Oh, yeah. I forgot about that one. <laughs> you just forgot. <laughs> and you, you put one of my songs on it, which was cool, If I yeah. Could Touch Your Life. Well, what we did is we asked people to donate a song. I think you were very really gracious about it, along with some of the other artists, including um, Steve Salas, one of the original uh, uh from Tierra, uh, he donated one of his songs too. So mm -hmm. everybody donated stuff. Chico, and I had a cut on it also, and yourself. It wasn't a bad one. We got, and we put it out, and we raised a little bit of money for for, for Jaime. So I think uh, the last thing to talk about is uh, the uh, the whole thing with the Sound of Music record store, right? So I remember uh, there was an event uh, in the behind the uh, Sound of Music uh, record store on Whittier Boulevard when it was at its old location. And some bands played, your band played. And in fact, um, I went up and sang one song with your band. I did a knock on wood. And it was a nice, and a lot of the East LA musicians showed up. Rudy Salas was there, uh, just a bunch of people. It was great. And uh, then uh, a few years later, when they moved across the street, that was recently, right? Like, was that last year? About three years across... ago now. What? About three we... years. No. That kind of yeah. felt like a year ago. Yeah, no, no, it was. Like and they moved across the street to what used to be the Silver Dollar Saloon, exactly. historic yeah. building. He's there. Um, and we played in the back of that too. And uh, I sang a few songs with your band, and you and I got to finally sing. We did my babe. We did my babe together. Yeah. And I'm still waiting to get a video of that. I'd love to have <laughs> a clip of that. Uh, well, I'll, I'll throw. It. Now that I'll you bribe you. Now that you mentioned that, you yeah, it's. We actually started a documentary on the sounds of music in yeah. uh, on Carlos, the, uh, the owner, Carlos Reyes. Reyes. And uh, I thought it'd be interesting to, since we really didn't get a chance to re record or tape the one you're talking about, the first one where it was back there, we, when he moved to the new location, that's when you were helping us now, Jerry Gonzalez. Yes. We had another young band that was very, very good. Mm -hmm. And my band, we're planning to use some of those. Some of the the uh, quality didn't come out really well with the uh, with the recording itself, but the camera turned out to to be pretty decent quality. I think we can salvage that. The camera's mm -hmm. recorded, mm -hmm. and uh, we're planning to use some of the footage for nice. the, it's for a documentary documentary called "Still Standing: The Life of Carlos Reyes and Sounds of Music Record Shop." So Very nice. it, it's taking a little time, but we'll we'll get there. We're trying to get. Cool. There. Well, the other time I got to sing with you was when Chan Romero was doing an album here. Chan Romero of the Hippie Hippie Shake fame. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was doing an album in your studio, and he recorded one of my songs called uh, "Rockin' Like There's No Tomorrow." Anyway, uh, Chan, you and I did like back 
background vocals on about four or five songs, and that was a blast because it sounded really good. The three of us, oh, and we were doing. I just you know, remembered that right now. I yeah, forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah, and that and we were. Seeing, that my studio was upstairs. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So that's a great memory. So those are the only two times I've ever sung with you. That doing those backgrounds, which was great, and then my babe uh, live, and it sounded good. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to do another one, maybe uh, in the studio and record some stuff. There you go. Yeah. I'm ready. So uh, just in uh, just kind of summing it all up. So what are your kind of your feelings and your memories of the whole East L.A. music scene of the 60s? Uh, you have mainly pleasant memories. And uh, how do you feel about it? It was a wonderful experience uh, for me. I've been so to use the word blessed or, you know. Coming from a family like, you know, 12, the youngest of it, and being farm workers, I never knew I was poor because it was such a wonderful time, Delena. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew you. Uh, you know, I love girls. <laughs> you know, I picked a little cotton, but I was pretty <laughs> good in sports. I, I started getting popular as a singer. You know, it was wonderful. You know, in my family, wow. I was really happy. And then when I got here, once again, in two weeks, I belonged to a group, you know, that became the Midnighters. And there were so and, many bands and, and so and many venues. And oh, it was amazing. But then it started sparking up. Then all of a sudden, Beatlemania and things, we got caught up in all of that. And my God, you know, look, look at all the flyers that you just talked about. Not to mention hundreds of gigs that yeah, forgotten about. Yeah. So... Uh, I see nothing but good. I remember nothing but good. Sure, I'm sure there was some bad stuff, breakups, and and uh, but for the most part, eighty percent of my thinking right now, my feeling is that it was wonderful. Meeting people like ourselves, we're still, we're you know, hey, thank God we're still here. Some of our friends yeah. are not here anymore, you know. So I see it nothing but but positive stuff and the future. I still see young people out there, not only as ourselves who are still able to. To perform, but the, the chance to help other people, maybe through the studio, you know, and uh, and I shouldn't say maybe I say that in a humble way. That's yeah. my that's my goal. Yeah, you know, to create yeah. a, a location. It was a special time. I mean, you know, th that didn't happen again. You know, how many places are there? So many teenage venues and so many bands, and a scene just exploding on its own. It just was amazing. It was you relative know, to Liverpool in a way. Yeah, Liverpool was a similar thing at the same time. Yeah, different times, you know, when yeah. things happen like that, you know. Yeah, just certain special time in places. New York and in certain areas, you know. Yeah. But it, the explosion was definitely here, and I was in the middle of it. That's right. You certainly know, were. So what can you say but being, wow. I, yeah. I Being humble, and I forget about that. And since we did it so long, we've, done, we've been doing this since, what, some more kids. So after yeah. a while, you can almost get numb. It's easy to get yeah. sensible about things, but when you stop and think about it, it's like how many of you have had that opportunity? Right. Well, the other thing too about you and I is that we're old geezers now, if I may say. Hey, but we're, for yourself, we're man. <laughs> <laughs> but we're still enthusiastic and we're still on fire. You know, yeah. I know you are, man, yeah, and I yeah. feel I am too. Yeah. We're still, uh, we're not just going, wow, look like at the old days. We're still trying to rock. That's it, and I'm not trying. We're. We, we you know are what I'm saying we're rocking, you know. We are rocking. We're rocking. The, <laughs> the thing is, you got to keep it rolling. You got to keep right. it going. Um, it's just like the, the your body and your mind, and uh, like the vocal cords work that way. And you know, you got to keep it perpetual if you can. Use it or lose it. Yeah, that's a great keep, way to keep say moving it. Moving forward and rock, keep rocking. You got that happening, and that still makes me happy. At, yeah. at, at my worst time, if I start singing, I I forget about stuff. Yeah. And my good times, it's even even higher. There you go, man. Music has always saved me, you know? Well, thanks for doing the show, Ray. Appreciate hey, man. It. I'm very honored that you, you've asked me. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm all yours whenever you need any, any info from me, any way I can help you. And Likewise, you know, man. Okay. Take care, brother. Thank you. Bye-bye.